Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to the uh, Regional Geriatric Program of Toronto Network webinar. Um, I'll be your host. I'm Ken Wong here on behalf of the RGP of Toronto team. Uh, and I just want to start with a few uh, webinar-related announcements. Um, I hope everyone's been able to sign on and are hearing the audio as well. I just finished an announcement, just in case you're on telephone, to please keep your phone on mute um, so we don't bring in background noise. I think um, probably my uh, empty stomach growling throughout the presentation might be as much background noise as we could tolerate for this presentation. Um, the other thing is we do, uh, we do encourage you to participate in the discussion. And you can do so with the chat box. That's on the bottom right of your screen. You can hit the cursor on the line at the bottom, type in your comments, and we welcome you to type in your comments at any point in the conversation. And uh, the presenter and I will monitor your comments and reply to them uh, at an appropriate time during the discussion. Uh, and uh, we often get a lot of questions on whether uh, this presentation will be available afterwards, and the answer to that is yes. We'll be recording the presentation, and we'll forward a link to that when we send out the evaluations afterwards. So welcome to the webinar. Just a quick introduction. Um, Dr. Diana Anderson, who's our guest speaker today, is an architect certified with the American College of Healthcare Architects as well as a physician certified through the American Board of Internal Medicine. And she's coined the term docitect, and in this role combines educational and professional experience in medicine and architecture. She's published widely in both fields and has worked on hospital design products, uh, projects across the United States, Canada, and Australia. Um, we're very excited to have her here today. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the RGP of Toronto's Senior Friendly Care Framework may be aware that uh, it encourages a holistic approach to designing care and service for frail older adults, and one of its five domains is the physical environment. Um, by way of a more hot off the press update, Dr. Anderson is putting the pieces together to begin a geriatrics fellowship. So we really, really welcome her hybrid of expertise, both uh, in architecture and in medicine and geriatrics, and hope that the conversation today she'll share with us will give you many ideas to, uh, to uh, fine-tune your physical spaces for your frail older patients. So as I've introduced her, and just before I turn it over to her, uh, we would like to know a little bit about you. So I'm going to pull up a poll that you can begin to enter, just click on the box there, but we're wondering if you could tell us what professional role you have in your team or at your organization. And if uh, none of those broad terms fit what you do, feel free to check other and type in the chat box and let us know uh, what sort of work to do so we can um, get an idea of who we're speaking with today. So I'll give you maybe another uh, five or 10 seconds to finish the reply. And I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Anderson, who uh, might comment a little bit and then carry on with her presentation. How's that, Dr. Anderson? Looks great, Ken. Hi, everybody. Very excited to be here today. Um, you're going to publish these results, Ken, in a second, I think, so everybody can see who we all are joining the webinar today, right? Yep, we can see them now. It looks like we've got about half our providers working on the front lines of care probably directly with patients is my guess. Also yeah, a chunk of um, managers. We've got a couple architects and designers in the room as well. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. So I'm showing up some floor plans. That will be exciting, I think. Some educators. Okay, so we've got a good mix. All right, so... I'm going to get started here, I think. So I'm going to change slides. All right, so hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about geriatric care at this intersection of the two fields that I've sort of been trying to merge for the last number of years throughout my career. And thank you for the introduction, Ken. Um, I studied medicine in Toronto, so I'm familiar with a number of projects in and around Toronto and Ontario. So I tried to pepper the presentation with a number of projects that you might be familiar with, some Canadian examples. I thought I'd talk about designing for the geriatric patient. Everybody's always interested in learning about what evidence we have and what designs we have to help design for dementia, falls, 
delirium and mobility, sort of the hot topics in geriatrics. So I'll touch on that today. But I also want to talk a little bit about designing for clinicians. And that's really the hot topic now in clinical journals, which I'm really excited to talk about. Everyone's sort of shifting from patient satisfaction to talking about the clinician and clinician wellness and care delivery and how design can actually impact how we deliver care. We'll talk about that a little bit because I think maybe the providers in the audience will be really interested and have something to say. So I'd love to hear your comments as we get into that topic. Okay, everyone says to speak a little bit closer. How's that? Let me know if everyone can hear me. And then designing for the future. There's a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline in design, so a lot of future thinking. And when I say future, I'm talking about 2050, so 30 years down the road, which isn't really that far away. I think you might be interested to hear about what geriatricians are thinking about. Are we even going to have hospitals 10 or 20 years from now? So what drives the change in hospital architecture? I pulled this from the archives where I trained for my residency in New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. I like this quote by Leland Kaiser. You know, he said, the hospital is something we invented, so therefore we can change it at any time. And I like that thought. Sort of like in medicine, when we develop clinical guidelines and diagnostic criteria for a disease, we can maybe change those, and we often do. This picture is probably from late 19th century, early 20th century. These don't really look like geriatric patients much. They actually look pretty well, don't they? Don't really look all that sick. Everyone's up playing cards, reading magazines. Sort of a Florence Nightingale ward. Everybody's sitting up in an open space, lots of light and ventilation. So that type of hospital space, we don't see much anymore. We moved into a very uh, industrial period of machine-like hospital centers when we developed pharmaceutical treatments and critical care technology around the 1950s, 1960s. And we developed, you know, think general hospital soap opera time when we developed office-like, box-like, big hospital towers. Well, we've moved away from that. You know, while medical science can often disguise mortality with technology, we're really now revisiting different ideas in hospital design to demedicalize architecture. This is what our hospitals are starting to look like today. These are very new buildings in the last year or two. On the top, this is a pediatric hospital in the United Kingdom, really coming up and out of the landscape. It's almost part of the landscape. Lots of green roofs. And on the bottom, it's a new hospital in Singapore. Balconies for every room. This hospital actually doesn't have many single patient rooms. Lots of open patient rooms with multiple beds, but every patient bed has a view of the outdoors and has access to a balcony. Okay, I have a couple of questions to keep everyone on their toes, and each question is based on a research paper, which you can then look up if you're interested. So what percentage of the time can patients actually distinguish their positive healthcare experience with the environment from their experience with actual care they receive? What an interesting idea. People always want to know how much architecture impacts care delivery versus the actual care patients receive. Big question in the U.S. when satisfaction is such a driver. And the results are live. Okay, so the answer is actually 25%. So a bit of a varied result. People thought maybe 50% of the time. So this that study was actually published in the Journal of Hospital Medicine probably about four years ago. And they looked at the question of design and the impact of satisfaction on the hospital setting. They actually moved patients from an old building to a new building and looked at drivers on satisfaction. And they found about 25% of the time patients actually were impacted by the physical environment more than the care they received. So sometimes we say for architects, place matters. And I'd like to suggest that for all of us, design matters. And while the architectural effect of healthcare environments on patients is pretty indirect, I think it's still pretty significant. So the reference for this study is at the bottom of the slide, if anyone's interested. Something though that's interesting to consider is when we design, we have a certain intention of what we want to gain and how we want users to experience the space. This is a typical example we learn about when we take urban planning or urban design classes, when we talk about developing a campus. You know, the professor will tell us, well, if you're going to develop a campus, you develop where you want to put the buildings, you pave the paths you think are most efficient to those buildings, but give it a year. 
and in a year you come back, and there'll be certain footpaths right through the grass you planted, where students and faculty will take the most direct path they feel is most efficient, that you didn't expect. And this is very true in medicine, too. We design these healthcare spaces, but the clinicians will find you know, ways of using it that we didn't expect or we didn't foresee as designers. And there's often a gap between medicine and architecture. And through my hybrid field and what is developing in terms of these hybrid fields, merging design and health, we're trying to close that gap. I'll show you what I mean. This is another archival photo. Here's a med student with his short white coat <laughs> examining a patient. You can see that he's standing on the right-hand side of the patient. And that's what's unique about the photo, and I like to point this out. When I did medical school, if we approached the patient from the left-hand side, we definitely lost points. This is very conventional in North America and throughout Europe. I've asked a number of colleagues in Ireland and England, mostly for anatomical reasons, maybe some old-fashioned convention. Um, can we approach from the right-hand side when we enter our clinical exam room? Here was my clinic exam room throughout most of residency. Did this, did this impact the way I approached my patients? Definitely. Did it throw me off? Yes. So where was that disconnect that happened throughout the design process? Definitely there's a gap. And this can close if there's more communication between designers and clinicians, in my opinion. Here's another example, patients and designers and the patient experience. This was a coronary care unit. Patient was recovering, not intubated and ventilated like an intensive care unit. I went in one day on rounds and said, are you enjoying the sunrise this morning? And he said, well, doc, I can't see out the window from where I am. The head wall had cut right across the window to hold all the medical gases. You can see in the photo I put an arrow, understanding that you know, design intent and user experience often can be broken with something in between, and that communication is really important with design teams and the users of the space is something that I think we still struggle with with hospital design. And so this idea of convergence of architecture and medicine is something people are wondering about. And I gave a lecture last year for a history of medicine conference and looked at this question and I think architecture and medicine have converged at various points in history. One in particular, the early 19th or 20th century tuberculosis sanatorium is one place where architecture and medicine definitely overlapped. Some of you may know this project in Finland by architect Alvar Aalto, looking at this sanatorium as therapeutic architecture. It's a wonderful project. It really illustrates this infrequent intersection where the healthy building emphasizes the contact with nature. And we saw these modern hospitals last year, the year before in Singapore and the UK, they're bringing nature back, developed to prevent the spread of contagion by isolating patients and preparing them to return to normal life. We didn't have any other way of treating tuberculosis. We didn't have any antibiotics back then. So the only way we could treat them was through the building. The architect even designed the door handles so white coats wouldn't catch as doctors walked by. Every detail was thought of. It became a benchmark for modern hospital design. Wrote an interesting article about it called Humanizing the Hospital for the CMAJ. Even the sinks were designed so if patients washed their hands, there wouldn't be any splashing, with separate sputum buckets so there wouldn't be any cross-contamination. So the sanatorium sets us up for hospital design and treating through the building. So let's talk about geriatrics and the aging population and how we can design for prevention. Can architectural act, architecture actually affect our health? And is hospitalization hazardous? This is a question architects are asking ourselves more and more. And as we age, we all know we have diminished physiologic reserves. And one geriatrician colleague out at UCSF, I think, said it best, and I tried to draw it. But she said, you know, when we're younger, we tend to stand on a mountain. And we have a long way to go until we tip the edge. And I'm doing some little doodles as I go here. But when we age, that mountain shrinks a little and becomes more like a sharp cliff. It doesn't take much to push us over. 
And so elderly patients, look at this headline from Kaiser 2016. They come to the hospital sick, but they leave disabled. That's a pretty bold headline. They don't leave disabled because of what they came in with. We can treat a pneumonia. We can treat a UTI, urinary tract infection. So what's going on? Here's another question. At what point during a hospital uh, stay does a functional decline from baseline occur for patients? Does it happen right away? Maybe on day two? Maybe does it take a week or just a few days? When it's Ken here, our uh, senior friendly hospital collaborative has been working on a functional decline in early mobilization for, oh, the, the better part of four or five years now. So my guess is a lot of people are going to get this answer right, but we'll see. And the answers are live now. I made this kind of a trick question. So day one, day two, yeah, I think people caught on. You know, this happens right away when people first get into the hospital. I based this question on a great paper, which probably most of you have seen, from the Annals of Internal Medicine back in the early 90s by Dr. Morton Creditor called Hazards of Hospitalization of the Elderly. Oh, and Ken, you can take away the poll. Thanks. Um, and in the paper, Dr. Creditor says the negative effects of hospitalization begin immediately and progress rapidly. And he says functional decline occurs by the second day and improve, improve little by discharge. It's a great paper that basically says what's happening is we're treating patients with what they come in with, but it's the hospitalization itself that is causing this disability. You know, putting patients in bed is really the problem. Um, critical illness is becoming a public health issue. This is a picture of a patient in a critical care unit uh, I snapped when I was a resident. And this patient was stuck in bed for weeks, as you can tell. I think there was an ECMO machine in there. We couldn't even get to the bed to put in an art line. Um, we do know that lower functional status of discharge leads to increased mortality of patients. And the rule of thumb we used to use on rounds is for every day an elderly patient, and by elderly, you know, 80s and over, we're not talking someone in their 50s, 60s, but for every day an elderly patient is in bed, it used to be about a week of rehab we would plan for at discharge. And I used to think about that when I would go home too tired to write a discharge summary that you know, another day a patient is left in the hospital would be another week that I'd have to send them to rehab. Patients are not going home. In his paper, Dr. Creditor cites two or three studies that looked at discharge rate to nursing home after hospitalization. And he says, uh, in conclusion, that 55 to 75 percent of patients end up in either rehab or nursing homes without going home. Um, pretty striking results. This cascade of dependency, he has this wonderful graphic in the paper that I've resketched and colored for effect. But you know, in pediatrics, they always teach us that children are not little adults with respect to their physiology. Um, Older adults are also not the same. Bone density is different. Skin thickness is different. Uh, vasomotor stability is different. You put someone with different physiology in bed in a hospital and add physical restraint, chemical restraint, dehydration, malnutrition, and you get pressure sores, delirium, all of these things that occur. And the bottom line is not going home. And this cascade of dependency all has to do with this immobility bed rest, not really what they came in with. And it happens quickly. So for designers, we think about the bed. You know, and I love this quote from this article because he says, I know of no evidence that shows the therapeutic value of bed rest. And it's sort of true. You know, I can think of certain post-procedural times where you would need strict bed rest, maybe some obstetrical examples. And if anyone has any examples, please share. Uh, but I can't think of examples where you would need three, four, five days of strict bed rest. But for us as designers, this is what we do. We take this, and this is a floor plan of a patient room, a bird's eye view. Here's the bed, looking from above to, to the furniture. And we design around this bed. This is our key element. We've always done that. Can we get rid of the bed? Not to say that patients don't need to sleep. Of course they do. But can we develop a design with possibly a smaller component for sleep? Because patient rooms just keep getting bigger and bigger. Do they need to? 
Can we have a lounge chair component where patients are forced to sit in, not be in bed? Can they be moved? Can we have porch-like concepts in the corridors where patients are out and about? Do they have to be lying down most of the day? I don't have the perfect answer, but nobody's really moving towards this as far as I know. If your institutions or hospitals are doing something, please share in the comment box. We'd love to hear about it. You know, when I was in medical school, geriatric giants were talked about a lot, falls, incontinence, cognition, polypharmacy. Now I hear a lot about these healthy aging goals. We've shifted to talk about things like prevention, rehabilitation, independent living. But what if the environment can be really seen as this third healer? We talk about the patients and their bodies and their caregivers, and then you have the second arm of this relationship, which is the caregiver and the clinician. But the environment really is this third pillar, I think, collaborative healing. The environment plays an important role. The environment is very important when we talk about this neurocognitive disorder or dementia. Here you have an image of the plaques and tangles in the brain. And as we go, I hope that some references I provide might be helpful to some of you out there. And there's a wonderful book called Lost in Space, if you're looking for examples of architecture and dementia care. So this is a European book. Um, I put the editors on the screen. But it references relevant peer-reviewed literature and built examples all in Europe. It's very richly illustrated, and it argues that architecture impacts how we behave, essentially influencing our moods, feelings, and memories. Architecture really has the power to do more than keep people just safe or satisfied. It improves our quality of life, and it renews our material and spatial awareness. What's interesting is it includes essays by sociologists, philosophers, gerontologists, and architects. And it includes a number of different precedents throughout the book with floor plans and pictures. So a very good reference. Another excellent reference, and I've seen your, the Code Plus document as well as the updated version. Um, an excellent, excellent gold standard reference, uh, I have to say, for acute care spaces. I've not seen anything like it. Um, something that complements Code Plus, I think, is this document, which looks at residential care design for patients and their families. Um, this looks at home design for dementia-friendly dwellings. It's put out by Ireland, and they look at something called universal design. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the concept of universal design. You may be familiar with something called ADA, the American Disabilities Act, where you might have a separate bathroom that's designed bigger to accommodate someone in a wheelchair, along with your standard size bathroom. There is some thinking in Europe that we might not want to think that way. Instead of having separate bathrooms for patients or people with disabilities, why not have something universally designed? So you can see the definition. This should be accessible to people who are older, people who have disabilities, and people who don't. And my friends in Ireland like to just say, you know, if you're 92 and have a walker, you should access a space. If you're two years old and learning how to walk, you should be able to access the same space. Or if you're 29 and in college and getting over a hangover, same thing. So every space should be accessible to everybody. And I have to say I really like that concept quite a lot. So this document is available online. It's a PDF, quite large, uh, to email, but it's available. And it, what's nice about it is it contains floor plans, wonderful colorful gra graphics like I've posted on the slide here, um, and a lot of tips to share about how to design the home or retrofit a home for people who might have various stages of dementia and for their families as well. So quite a good reference. Something I've thought a lot about lately, but there isn't a lot of literature on, is architectural ethics. I gave a talk about this in residency, and I called it bricks and morals, kind of a play on bricks and mortar, but nobody got it, I think because bricks and mortar is too much of an old-fashioned expression, and my colleagues were too young. Anyway, architectural ethics. We talk a lot about bioethics, and something I think a lot about is how can the building play into ethical questions and concepts. In dementia care, it's interesting to think about the building acting as a type of restraint. And I think we, we do do this. And you can see here in the image, and we know about this, we use the building to contain patients in a way. This is a concealed exit in a dementia care facility. 
and some of you may have this in your own facilities. Is this something we should do? Can we do anything differently? How do we address wandering with dementia care? On the left, this is the use of floor patterns. And we have actually literature on this. There's a number of papers, at least 10 I've seen, that use dark floor patterns in front of doors and elevators. Patients with dementia might interpret this as a void, and it might make them afraid to go towards an exit. The Europeans have a different concept. They don't feel this is necessarily ethical to use. They prefer to have freedom of movement and meaningful activity. So on the right is a photograph of de Hodgwick, which is the dementia village in the Netherlands. It's featured in that book, Lost in Space, I mentioned a few minutes ago. The dementia village is quite an interesting concept. It has been published widely. It's an actual gated village with uh, residential apartments, but it has a grocery store, a hairdresser, little shops. Residents can go out, do their shopping, wander freely. Everything is gated eventually with um, security guards of a sort, but dressed in plain clothes, nothing that'll be too intimidating. And they report much less use of medication, chemical restraint, much less agitation by patients. It's very successful. So they promote wandering. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of good data out there in terms of trials or published studies to show that this type of village design really does have good outcomes. I'd like to see more of that. What about patient falls? Everybody's interested in falls. In the US, it's a big deal. Falls in hospitals should be a never event. Administrators are very interested to prevent them. What's the evidence on architecture preventing falls? So we like to grade our evidence like we do in medicine. We have you know, randomized control trials, very good. Anecdotal evidence, not so great. Architecture, you know, we don't, it's very hard to do randomized control trials for the built environment. But we have very good evidence that bed rails don't reduce falls. In fact, they cause more harmful falls. People get twisted up. Injuries are worse. So we know that. We have some pretty good evidence that single patient rooms and good visibility into the room prevent falls. We had originally thought that multiple beds in one room decrease falls because people's neighbors would call out and alert staff that people would fall. But in the end, we had shown that people would just draw their curtains, patients would fall. With single rooms, patients' families tend to alert staff. We have some best practice evidence coming through in the architectural literature that putting the toilet room on the same side of the bed and having good large bathrooms with wide doorways and these continuous handrails, so having a continuous, sorry, continuous handrail might prevent falls. Not very good hard data yet on that one. We looked at a study at Columbia Presbyterian for three years and pulled their falls data, almost 2,000 falls in one calendar year. We looked at where those falls were happening. We know falls happen in patient rooms and toilet rooms during transfers. That's not a surprise. What was a surprise is about 20% of those falls were not in the patient room. They were all over the hospital, in the clinic, the emergency department, in the corridors the radiology suites and the operating room. That surprised us. What was even more surprising is that three quarters of the people who fell had fall protocols in place. They still fell. Something wasn't working there. And the majority of our fallers actually weren't geriatric patients at all. They were under 50 years old. Something which we postulated in our results had to do with the fact that it was a tertiary care center and patients were quite sick many transplant patients, many in the intensive care unit. So when we think about fall design, we can't only limit it to the patient room and toilet room. We really need to think about it as a campus-wide issue, especially with respect to design. The window. Everybody talks about the window. 1984 was the year the pivotal study came out, Dr. Roger Ulrich's study looking at post-surgical patients. One group looked at a window and trees like this. One looked out a, a window at a brick wall. Which group did better? The group that looked at nature. That started evidence-based design. 
Over 30 years later, we now have a robust group of studies, and we now base many of our design decisions on those studies, just like we do in medicine. As a resident, my first week in intensive care, I had a patient in her 80s, Ms. T. I wrote about her. She made such an impact on me in the journal of the American Geriatric Society. She was delirious. She was um, a tracheostomy, actually, but she's intubated in my sketch from my journal. But she was in a windowless room up here. Across the hall, we had windows. Half our intensive care rooms didn't have windows, half did. She was so delirious and tachycardic with a fast heart rate that didn't respond to medication, we moved her. So we moved her to a window room, which had sun. We looked at the data. The medical team actually pulled the literature on delirium and windows, and she improved. It made such an impact, we wrote about it. Not to say that windows fix delirium, because we don't know that. There's some studies to suggest they help, but we can't say for sure. But she improved, and the lesson of the story was the medical team actually considered it a part of their treatment plan because of the data that's been published, which is pretty significant. And in my treatment plans after that, window rooms were always considered if we could do it. You know, in medicine, the providers will know we have acute kidney failure, acute heart failure, delirium, we like to say, is an acute brain failure. It's very hard to treat once it happens. The best thing to do is to try to prevent it. You know, Dr. Dennis Burkitt, we named Burkitt's lymphoma after him, he said that disease can rarely be eliminated through early diagnosis or good treatment, but prevention can eliminate disease. And especially in geriatrics, I think falls and delirium, uh, you know, these things we want to try to prevent. It's very hard to deal with them once they happen. So if we can prevent them, that's the most important. You're not meant to read this slide at all. It's from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a treatment algorithm for delirium. But what I've circled is all the components of that algorithm where design can have an impact. So reorientation, normalizing sleep-wake cycles, family presence, all of these areas where we as designers can have an impact. That's a lot of different places. We don't have a lot of good pharmacologic solutions to delirium. So intensive care unit design is a big topic. Does it matter? There's some pretty good evidence that it does. On the right is a floor plan of an ICU. The yellow rooms in the corners, a resident noticed that patients weren't doing well in those rooms because staff couldn't see them well from the central nursing station. So he did a study. And he found that there was a relationship between mortality and visibility. That study was actually duplicated, and the results were the same. Another study, I just told you that windows had an impact on delirium. A study a couple of years ago contraindicated that and found that windows actually don't matter. It was published in the medical literature. The study found that ICU rooms with windows and natural views don't improve outcomes or reduce costs in ICU patients. It sort of rocked the design world. And for any of the designers or architects out there, you can look up the study. A follow-up editorial by some architects suggested that, you know, maybe patients are too sedated, and this might not impact them as much as it can. Maybe it's more for staff and patients. Maybe the study was retrospective, and delirium rates went underreported because they looked at delirium and they looked at length of stay. So some interesting take-home messages that, you know, we need more studies. These were small studies, um, and evidence-based design is still growing. I see some uh, comments coming in, so Ken, we're keeping an eye on those, I hope. And please feel free to comment as we go. This sketch is an ICU in Portland, Oregon, a very nice unit with floor-to-ceiling breakaway windows where the patient can actually go outside onto a terrace in their bed. All ICUs are required to have windows now as part of the building code standards. I actually feel that we should go and retrofit old buildings that don't have windows with windows because of what I've seen working in intensive care units. But that's not standard in the building codes yet. For units that don't have access to the outdoors, we have virtual windows or skylights. This is Mount Sinai Hospital's geriatric emergency department. I believe the first emergency department that was geriatric 
friendly in the US, it's actually now the pediatric ER. We converted the geriatric ER to a pediatric ER. Diana, we have a question from Francis about uh, whether patients should be facing the windows. Uh, you might comment on that. Oh, very good question. Yes, so it's a very good question, actually. So we always design, so we always design ICUs with these great, I'll go back, these great floor-to-ceiling windows, but we never orient the bed towards them. And I judge an ICU design competition every year, and we get submissions from around the world, and they always state in their submission entries how the bed can swivel around, because you'll notice these ceiling-mounted booms, we call them, that rotate so you could rotate the bed around and still have all your equipment rotate with the patient. But we never do that, because we always have to see the patient from the staff core. Um, but it's an interesting concept that it could be done, but it never, ever is, because everyone always needs to see the patient. But, I, but you're asking probably what if that might have an impact on delirium rates, potentially. There have been some projects that have contemplated putting in virtual windows on the other side of the room so that those face the patient. That might be something that would be interesting to do, or to reflect the window through some sort of apparatus towards the patient so you could still retain visibility and have potentially your sleep-wake cycles retained through some sort of mirrored apparatus or virtual capability. That's a very interesting concept. I have to come back to that. I'm going to go down. And if anyone has these ideas in their institutions, I'd love to hear about it. This is an idea of a way to bring light in from above. This is a sanatorium in Finland. And closer to home, Credit Valley Hospital in Toronto. By Pharaoh's bringing in natural tree-like structures into the atrium with wood and skylights. Ah, mobility. So this is interesting. The Annals of Internal Medicine, just over a year ago, actually said that physical inactivity is the fourth leading cause of death and disability in moderate to high income countries. And they called for prescribing exercise, which would be just as important as prescribing medication. And so what I've drawn for you on the left is the Pioneer chair from the tuberculosis sanatorium that Oliver Alto actually designed. He calculated the exact angle of the chair which would be needed so that a patient with tuberculosis could breathe easier when they reclined in the chair. He knew that sputum collected in the lungs, so he decided he would calculate at what angle would be most comfortable. And he placed these chairs at strategic places on staircase landings so patients would have to use the staircase to get to them. Oh, I have a budget question. I'm going to table that for a little bit, but just to kind of comment, a lot of these projects that you see coming in from Europe and some of the intensive care unit designs we see being entered in our annual competition that come in from overseas are actually on or under budget with a lot of these innovative ideas. It doesn't necessarily need to be expensive. And we even see things like electrostatic glass being utilized instead of curtains, which is quite good with respect to infection control. People think it's very expensive with a bigger upfront cost. But it doesn't necessarily have to be expensive to be innovative. Um, but we can talk about that maybe a little bit later. Also, actually, also wanted people to come out of their rooms to eat. And so he designed a communal dining room. And I know a Canadian nursing home, I think out west, employed this idea. The architects talked to the facility directors, and they decided the residents should come out for every fifth meal. So I don't know if any of your facilities do this, but instead of being in their room every fifth meal, it was sort of a rule. Uh, residents had to come out to the dining room. And that forced people to be mobile and social. Isolation is a big problem, as we know, in our society especially for elderly patients. We're in an era of complex chronic syndromes. You'll probably recognize Bridgepoint, Active Health in Toronto. I mean, this project just revitalized the idea of mobility and getting patients out and about with all of their gardens and outdoor spaces. This particular um, outdoor space is reminiscent of ancient healing temples and spiritual locations. And I want to read a passage from an article from Intensive Care Medicine last year by Dr. Vincent where he was asked to imagine what an ICU would be like in 2050. So he's pretending to be a patient. And this is what he says. The older doctors and nurses tell us that in the past, ICU patients were often sedated and some even paralyzed. That's really hard to believe. 
Bed rest is no longer considered a benefit at all. Patients are not allowed to stay in bed at night unless you're in shock or in a coma. As soon as my shock was resolved, the physiotherapist introduced me to Jim, my personalized robot, and explained how he would help me exercise and walk with me. We even get to go out into a landscape garden surrounding the ICU when the weather is good. I almost think it's a little bit bittersweet to think that a physician who's writing about 30 years from now has to write about the fact that he might have a garden in 30 years next to his patient room. I think that should be standard now. The hospital corridor, so this is the sanatorium again, beautiful yellow, colorful, bright corridor ringing in light and plants. But I ask you, do you think the hospital corridor can be more? Is this an untapped space that we could possibly do more with? Minimum eight feet wide is the mandatory regulation in the building code, but so much happens in this space. We round, we gown and glove, we chart, we have family discussions. And look what else we do. This is an intubated ICU patient who's doing his physical therapy. He is walking with a tube in his lungs. It just boggles my mind whenever I see this photo. And on the right-hand side, you might be wondering what these numbers are. This is Memorial Sloan Kettering's ICU in New York City. Patients are walking every day. They said to the director, I need to know that I'm doing better. I need to know how far I go. This isn't the only ICU that's putting numbers in to help patients track their distance. Everybody okay with sound? Ken, am I coming through? Yes, um, I'm just typing a note for everyone. We are recording the session. Uh, the audio is coming good here, so if you're able to uh, crank up your computer speaker, that might be the solution on your end. But we are recording this so you can hear uh, this over uh, at your leisure. This is another way to re-envision the hospital corridor. I talked a lot about getting patients out of their room and out of bed. This is an elderly care um, section of a hospital looking at maybe an indoor-outdoor type of space, the idea of the porch. And we see this in pediatric care centers. Maybe there's a way to have the corridor be more than just an intermediate space. Can it be a space that's dynamic where activity can happen? So space for clinicians. The ACP, American College of Physicians, last year, this was their cover story. How long is too long in the hospital for doctors? Can we get them out? And here's another question. It's a Canadian question. Recently, the total cost of burnout among Canadian physicians was estimated to be how much? This was about in a year's time, I believe. I think this was a, two, three years ago. This is published in Critical Care Medicine. And uh, Diana, just as uh, we're getting the answers for the poll, I'm just going to wear my moderator badge for one second. I just note the slide count, and we're at about uh, 12 minutes remaining. So we want to hear everything. I, I've seen the content. So if possible, just to hit the gas a little bit faster, that would uh, help us get us through. Sure, no problem. And the results are live. Sounds good. So a bit of a split. So it's just over 200 million. Oh, people thought maybe 500 million. So it's pretty significant. Um, burnout is a big problem. They're publishing a lot about it in the US. So what can we do about it? Um, this is a, an interesting painting from Edward Briard. It was published in JAMA, looking at the old-fashioned doctor-patient relationship. You know, being at home, knowing a family for many years, the window in the background, comfortable setting, very different from the high-tech environment, technology, masks, gowns, the training of being in the battlefield into the trenches, this idea of boot camp, hazing. Johns Hopkins did a study about where we spend our time. It's definitely not on the perimeter of a building in a patient room where the sun comes in. We only spend 7.7 .7 minutes a day with patients. Usually we're at a computer or we're with other providers. So I call that the no sun zone. How can we bring in light for providers? Um, this is a ICU in Melbourne, Australia using clear story windows. They decided to not give light to patients but to give it to staff. 
that building code allows that there, we wouldn't be able to do that overseas here. This is a neat Canadian project by Stantec Architecture out in British Columbia, St. Paul's Hospital. This is an atrium design. You might know Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, one of the first atrium hospitals. That's a public atrium. But what if that atrium was only for staff? And that's what this is, a very vertically collaborative environment for staff with nature, not for the public. U of T decided to publicize the, the idea of physician mental health talking about who heals the healer last year in their magazine. And this idea of the reset room was something they asked me to help with. Where's the space that physicians can go and be able to reset their minds when things get tough? The doctor's lounge is something that doesn't really exist anymore. We work in a collaborative team now. And I noticed in residency that much of the difficulty was tied to space design. You know, it's, it's tough to be always on the front lines of care. So we looked at the idea of a floor plan and came up with some ideas of spaces that could be an area of respite, lighting and seating, plants and nature. We put it on Twitter and asked people to share their ideas. And the US is looking at this idea of a reset room. It was published in the American Medical Association Journal. Designing for collaboration is something we're talking about. The Salk Institute on the left, uh, designed by Louis Kahn in California is a lot like what we're seeing at Terence Donnelly in Toronto. The idea of a laboratory building that isn't just about lab space, but about social space. Why? Because 80% of breakthroughs don't happen at the lab bench. They happen in socialized settings where people can interact. Much like in the hospital. One doctor can't take care of a patient. It takes an entire team. I found in the hospital we didn't solve a lot of problems alone in a doctor's lounge. It was in the staircase where we could walk between floors on rounds and talk to other providers and the ally team. We couldn't talk in elevators because of HIPAA. And so looking at architecture and medicine, I actually don't think they're intersecting at various points in history anymore. I actually think they're converging, both looking at evidence, both looking at simulation and architecture. We build mock-ups, looking at virtual reality. And we're both trying to tackle the topic of the aging population and come up with solutions. You know, people have contacted me over the years, many physicians and medical students, asking for what I thought was mentorship. But I think what they're asking for is to build a skill set and knowledge base. And these are some quotes from emails I've had. Um, physicians want to learn design thinking, which is really a methodology used by designers to help solve problems. And so we formed a group called Clinicians for Design, which is an international network of leaders which forms a platform that engages clinicians in practice education and research. And so we're doing some colloquia and papers and really trying to understand how to bridge that gap I talked about between design intent and user experience. And so some things coming in the future, a good article in the New England Journal a few months ago saying the complexity of medicine now exceeds the capacity of our minds. A very mind-blowing statement just to think about calling for a change in medical curriculum that medicine is now a team sport and we need new players in data science and in statistics. Machine learning is a whole new thing in medicine and it's changing drastically. So Dr. Neil Halpern at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City and I were asked to envision ICU design in 2050 ourselves and look into the crystal ball. So we thought about capsules, biocapsules for patients instead of single patient rooms. Those are expensive. And we think in the future, maybe there won't be hospitals, or maybe hospitals will be critical care centers only. So these fancy capsules will have 3D printers and holographic technology, and you won't have to be intubated. You'll have a specialized helmet. You know the deal. You could place a lot of these capsules in one room. Does anyone know what this might remind them of? As we were drawing this, something came to mind from the 1950s. Does this remind anyone of something? <laughs> Star Trek. So this looks a lot like the iron lung during the polio era. So interesting how we might return to the past again like we do with the TB sanatorium and the idea of nature to achieve some things in the future. And are we going towards this now? More home and less hospital. This is a medication ad from a medical journal I cut out, which I thought was a really interesting graphic. What's our home of the future going to look like? We already have a bedroom, living room, and a kitchen in our homes. There are some researchers now thinking that 
if we don't really have hospitals or we have hospitals at home, maybe we're going to need other rooms. Maybe it's going to be just standard to have our health room at home, our lifestyle room where we do our mobility training every day. Maybe that's going to be just something of the future. So I don't know if you all have any ideas of a room type that you might already see in someone's home or something you think might be coming, but these are some ideas we're seeing that you know in 10 years might be standard. So that's uh, pretty much where I think health is going. I think architecture, planning, and design are now a component of health and what architects and designers are thinking about and medicine is now adopting. And if you enjoyed some of these stories and anecdotes and articles, they're in a recent book that I put together, which is on my website, or if you email me, I'm happy to send a copy from Montreal. And thank you very much. I think we have a couple of minutes for some questions. And I'm just reading through some of the comments, so Ken, maybe we can address a couple of them. We have some time. Yeah, absolutely. There was a, a comment earlier, and a few people commented towards that about um, cost, and I think you were going to get back to that. Yeah, so like having I was the saying, budget and some of these design um, design uh, ideas. Yeah, let me scroll back up and read some things a little bit more in detail. Like I was saying, it's not um, there are inexpensive initiatives. Yeah, I see that. So it's not always something that has to be a very expensive initiative to. to to be well designed, and spaces don't always have to be extremely large. You know, I think having worked in the U.S. a long time, we've seen a lot of very big, expensive designs that encompass um, lots of different features. But things can be very simple, um, elegant, clean, and very efficient, and do the same thing, and can often be under budget. And things don't always have to be done completely upfront. You know, many units will open and then adjust over the first year where patients, you know, get used to the space, staff get used to the space. Um, I think things don't have to be done all up front. Uh, Dr. Halpern's intensive care unit, for instance, he opened it and throughout the first year or two, but did a lot of different things that had to change. Um, so it's always something to think about that once you start using a space, you have to expect that things are going to change. It's, it's not perfect right at the beginning as you use it you have to realize that things are going to have to be tweaked along the way. So that's something I think people don't necessarily expect. And uh, if you want to study a space, um, it can't be studied right away when you first use it. You need to give it about at least a year to 18 months of using the space before any type of research can really be started in terms of a post-occupancy evaluation, which is something I think we really need more of in our research repertoire. It's Ken here, and, and Barbara uh, Miskeel, uh, who contributed to the Code Plus document. Um, in terms of the implementation when the rubber hits the road, the hospital organizations, the teams we've talked to who have um, done either a major or minor renovation using the Code Plus guidelines, they all unanimously tell us it's, no, it's cost neutral. Uh, doing the design right doesn't cost any more than, you know, you're, you're just buying the right furniture and putting in the right colors and the flooring textures. Um, you know, they've all said that uh, they can do this at the same cost as a conventional build. Uh, we, we will uh, forward a link to the Code Plus document as well as the universal uh, uh, design guideline that uh, Diana mentioned at the end of this uh, presentation. A couple other questions. Sean makes a good comment about how so much focus is on the hospitals and um, whether we can do more in the community. Do you have some thoughts on that? I'm just reading the question a little bit more. Yeah, no, Sean, that's a great comment, I think. Um, I definitely think that. I was just reading an article, I think even last night, off of Twitter about shifting our focuses and our resources to home care, and I think that can be money-saving as well um, for the healthcare system in general, too. You know, we're putting a lot of thought now into these geriatric emergency departments and geriatric hospital spaces, but there is some thinking that shifting our, our thinking towards the home and providing care in the home maybe means that we don't actually need to put so much thought into changing all our spaces within the hospital to geriatric friendly spaces. Maybe we don't even need to get patients to the hospital, and the hospital is such a hazardous place to begin with. 
So this hospital at home idea is an interesting thought that some East Coast centers are doing now where they'll deploy units or hospital type units with physicians, nursing care, even imaging care to a patient's home, almost like a mini hospital that will go into the home and treat patients there, avoiding the need to go to hospital. So everything will be done in the home. So budget, and it actually is budget saving in the end um, in the American system, which is pretty amazing. You would think it'd be more expensive, but it isn't. Um, so I agree with you. It's really time to shift our focus to home care, either deploying care when, need, when it's needed to the home or retrofitting homes, like that dementia care at home document I was showing you, um, providing care that way. Um, but it ends up being cost saving in a way or even retrofitting our cities to be, you know, um, age-friendly from a greater urban perspective on a macro scale. Thinking 10 or 20 years down the road when we might not even have cars. You know, I think it's hard to think so far ahead, but things are changing to such a greater scale from an urban planning perspective. Ken jumping in again, we are, we are running out of time. Um, I know, Diana, if you would be willing to hang on just for a couple more minutes for those that wouldn't mind sticking around for some questions. Um, I just want to uh, share an announcement about our next webinar. And also before that, just acknowledge some of the comments that are coming in about vegetation, living walls, enhancing areas, and um, whether there'd be tension with infection perfection, uh, in, in, infection protection, prevention and control. And also a comment from long-term care about um, having design resources for long-term care that uh, are better tailored. And I think that universal design guideline you had mentioned has some stuff on long-term care. Um, so if you don't mind sticking around, and people who want to uh, stick around for a few more minutes and ask questions, I just want to make this quick announcement about um, thanking you all for attending, uh, thanking uh, Dr. Anderson for this very insightful presentation. Uh, an evaluation survey will come later this afternoon. We will send links to the Code Plus document as well as the Euro Universal Design from Europe document that Dr. Anderson shared. Our next webinar is two weeks from now, March 13th, where we'll be celebrating World Delirium Awareness Day. And we have Nevo Regan from Western University talking about latest trends in delirium screening. So I'll leave you with those messages and then turn things back to Dr. Anderson for any final comments or to make um, some reflections on any of the questions that have come in. I can. Thanks a lot. Um, the living wall question is a good one about infection control and prevention. So utilizing plants and nature in hospitals, in the U.S. this is talked about quite a lot. Um, we use water walls as features, especially I worked down in Texas for a while, and these are common, and there's quite a lot of debate about using water features in hospitals. Um, there's some controversy using them in lobbies. Definitely in oncology suites, this is a no-no, no plants, no water. Um, I suspect in, um, in geriatric type units, maybe uh, acute care of the elderly type units, this would be more acceptable in a hospital setting. Um, Probably a little bit more expensive, so I think maybe cost prohibitive um, might be a factor. The living walls I haven't seen done too often in hospitals. If they are, they would be more in a lobby type setting and not so much in an independent ward. I haven't seen them done too many times in long-term care ever. I'm just thinking about um, overseas in Europe a little bit more frequently, nature is included. Um, overseas in general, you know, windows and operating rooms are more common, windows and laboratories, balconies, gardens, not as much in North America. Um, they haven't made it into our building codes as much as they are overseas. We have a, a few more comments about uh, inactivity and, and ways to promote that. And as well, uh, Karen suggests that fish tanks can be a way of engaging patients and having them a little bit more uh, involved. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I've seen that quite a lot. We use that a lot in pediatrics. So overall in pediatrics, we have quite a lot of color, um, fish tanks like you suggest, different types of themes, nature. We don't do it as much with the older populations of patients. Um, and I'd like to, you know, that would be something great to see as something more standard, even <laughs> older patients, even with adults. Color is really something we don't use a lot of the way we do with younger patient populations. It's just it's more, you know, more fun with pediatric centers, a lot more interactive. 
a lot more distractions, especially with the medical testing centers, CT scanners. We do a lot of different scenes, um, backlit panels with scenes of nature. There's not as much emphasis on distraction for adults and elderly patients. So it's Ken. I think I'll. Um, I think we'll bring things to a wrap. But Dr. Anderson, I want to thank you again for making so much time, and I know the time you put into making this uh, conversation relevant to our audience. Um, I think uh, to tie uh, all what we learned is there's many, many good ideas, some which may cost some, some which may not, and it would be really helpful to continue collaborating and having this discussion and sharing ideas because I think there's so much we can do to our environment to optimize both uh, the comfort and the function and safety for our frail older patients. Um, with that, I'll remind you that we'll, we'll send out a resource package along with the evaluations. You'll get that in a couple hours. Um, if you have further questions for Dr. Anderson, I'm happy to uh, be the liaison and I can connect you to her by email. She has a website for Docatect, also a published book, and there's many, many other writings that she could share with you uh, that we couldn't get to in this limited time frame, and so I'm more than happy to connect you. Uh, but with that, I want to thank you all for uh, spending time with us. I want to thank you for spending more than the hour with us and also Dr. Anderson for all the work you put into this it's a very insightful presentation. And on behalf of the RGP of Toronto, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, everyone, for listening today.